because it's been a bit just in time. So I'm going to talk about microbiomes and metagenomes uh, and the subtitle Windows on the Past, Promise for the Future. Now we start with just thinking about high throughput sequencing. We've all become comfortable with the idea that sequencing is now easy and it's cheap. Um, and um, we've made an impact here in, in, in my own group looking at uh, comparisons between various benchtop platforms. Uh, and one of the ways we got involved fairly early on uh, was through involvement in this, what has sometimes been called the sprout break, um, uh, an outbreak of E. coli infection, of, of sugar toxin inducing E. coli infection that struck Germany and was associated with the consumption of bean sprouts. And how we got involved was that um, the BGI actually sequenced the uh, outbreak strain on a novel benchtop sequencing instrument called the Iron Torrent. And at the time, we had I'd just won an Iron Torrent in a European-wide competition, and we were just uh, getting ready in my group, Nick Lohman in particular, to analyze data from the Iron Torrent. So Nick uh, kick-started these crowdsource analyses of that outbreak strain uh, genome. Uh, and we showed that social media, blogging, Twitter, and so forth could augment academic discourse. And, and it showed a key role for benchtop sequencers. Now, the reason I'm rushing through this is because we've said this thing many times before, and it did culminate in us getting a New England Journal paper. Um, but we hadn't actually met our German collaborators at the time we had this uh, paper published. And so Nick and myself went over to see them a, a few weeks after the paper came out. And you can see us there drinking some champagne with them. But we thought, well, hang on, how are we going to show the world that we're not just a, like a one-hit act here, one-trick pony? What could we do next uh, uh, as a collaboration that might do something novel and interesting and take us somewhere new? Um, and we looked at our unique selling points, and I said, well, we're pretty good at genomics and bioinformatics, and what are your unique selling points? And, and Martin Effelbacher said, well, I've got a freezer full of shit. Uh, basically had over 200 samples uh, from the outbreak. And so we came up with a project. If we're talking in the vernacular, we might say that the tagline for the project was just sequence the shit. Um, well, now, why would we do that? Well, if you think it, it, when you're in Germany, you know, microbiology in large part was invented in Germany. Maybe France and Denmark played a role. But Robert Koch basically was the one that showed us that we can grow things on solid media and attain colonies, and this is a good way forward. Uh, and, and Christian Graham showed us that we could use the microscope and do the Graham stain. But if you think about it, diagnostic bacteriology has been using those 19th century techniques for well over a century now, and maybe we should think about other ways, new ways of doing things. So what I said, well, why don't we just apply shotgun metagenomics? So instead of what happened during the outbreak, which was that the stool samples were, were uh, cultured, gave rise to a pure culture of the uh, offending outbreak strain, and then that was genome sequenced. Couldn't we get to the same place directly from the stool samples uh, without having to culture the organism first and just sequence uh, the, the DNA extracted from those fecal samples? So we had a go. They sent us uh, 10 samples to look at, and the first sample we looked at we were very, very pleased and encouraged by what we saw. So here, uh, Nick Lohman has actually uh, aligned uh, the reads from the um, metagenome, from what, what this stool sample, against the genome sequence of the outbreak strain. And there are a number of features that we were very heartened by. One is that we got quite substantial coverage, about 20-fold coverage, and not much less than you get if you were doing it uh, on a pure culture of the organism. Um, we noticed that there was this skew here, this kind of peak to trough skew in the coverage of the genome. Um, and we took that to, to mean that what we were seeing was actively growing cells and actively growing culture because the parts of the genome that are closer to the origin of replication are overrepresented uh, in this metagenome compared to those that are further away. And in fact, uh, although we noticed this, we did, we, and I think we mentioned it in the paper, we didn't make much of it. But there was a paper, I think it was last week or the week before in Science, that actually showed that this kind of peak to trough measurement is actually a very reliable way in metagenomes of working out which cells, which, which species are growing faster and which ones are growing slowly and actually coming up with, with growth rates just from the sequence data. 
We also noticed a little uptick there uh, where the sugar toxin encoding phage was, and, and we took that to mean that that was, we we're also detecting um, phage particles, DNA from phage particles there, evidence of lysis within that population. Uh, we haven't quite nailed that yet. There is the option that maybe we're also seeing um, tandem um, uh, uh, phage integrated into the chromosome, or maybe phage integrated into commensals that are in that population. We don't quite know. Nick was also able to go in there and do in silico MLST and actually retrieved a, a sequence profile uh, for it. So we felt very pleased with that, and we and, and we thought we were onto something. And in fact. Uh, JAMA, the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association, were doing a special issue on medical genomics, um, and we contacted them and said, oh, what do you think about this then? Um, and there was someone in the background, his name is almost certainly David Relman, who was acting as their kind of consultant on what, whether things were worth following up or not. And he said, ah, a lining against a known genome is cheating, isn't it? It's, it's like uh, trying to do a jigsaw puzzle when you've got the lid in front of you. What you should be doing is trying to solve this problem by uh, looking at the sequences from the metagenome as if you didn't know what the outbreak strain genome looked like. So putting yourself back in the feet of those people at the heart of the outbreak and saying, could you actually get that, that outbreak strain genome from the metagenome de novo without uh, any prior information? Now, that's quite a hard ask, but luckily Nick Lohman, who was doing the work, is one of those people that is fearless in his approach to challenges and he's extremely quick-witted as well. And so he did a, a couple of all-nighters um, and managed to solve the problem. So what he did was he assembled the metagenome, the metagenomes, from, we ended up with 40 samples in the end. Uh, he, he, he assembled um, all those metagenomes and then he said, let's look at these EGTs, express uh, uh, gene tags or contigs, that are present in more than two outbreak samples. And let's have a look at the coverage and look at the GC content. And then he did a quick, uh, quick and dirty taxonomic classification of the sequences using homology searching. And he came up with this. And you can see here that we're capturing a real mess of taxonomic diversity in here, um, in, this, in this, these metagenomes. Um, and although you can see a big pink splodge there that represents enterobacteriales, it's quite a long way from having a single genome. So he, he said, what, what simplifying assumptions can we make to actually take this further forward? So the first thing he did, we said, well, if this is an outbreak, uh, uh, we would expect to be able to detect the outbreak strain genome in at least half of the samples in our collection. So let's throw away all that sequence data that is not present, not represented in at least half of the outbreak. Uh, samples, and you can see here that this creates quite a great, uh, quite a good deal of simplification of that population, but still doesn't take us quite towards a single genome. And then he, his, his two of the forces was, was to actually say, well, actually, what we can do is we can also subtract everything that's in normal people, in healthy individuals. And luckily, we didn't have to go and find forty healthy Germans and go and uh, press gang them into giving us stool samples and sequence them. We could just go to the public databases, uh, and I think went to the MetaHit database and got some comparable sequences that were kind of matched in age and, and uh, origin of the population and so forth. And he subtracted all that and ended up here with um, a, a very much enriched uh, uh, genome. In fact, pretty much the, it was, you could, the, the things that were in the interactive came from the outbreak strain genome. Now, those of you who have woken up enough might say, well, hang on, uh, and Roy Chowdhury in particular over there sh would, would, would spot this immediately. you would say, but hang on, you've subtracted the core genome of the E. coli because that's in normal people, and what you're looking at here is the accessory genome. So, so, so to add back in the core genome, uh, Nick contacted a guy called Chris Quince who came up with a suggestion uh, that you could use the, the depth of coverage and the differences in depth of coverage represented in each sample as a way of pulling out the core genome. And to cut a long story short, we ended up with the, the uh, genome of the outbreak strain uh, captured from the metagenome de novo, and Nick here annotated various things that we saw in that, um, in that genome. And we ended up with a paper in, in, uh, in JAMA uh, as a result of that. So that was our first foray into using metagenomics in this way. 
But then around the same time, uh, I kind of got interested in, in ancient DNA uh, research. Uh, I'd read quite a lot about it. I used to teach on human genome evolution and read some of the papers. And I'm not going to go through each of, the, each of these bullet points here. But uh, it, it's, a, it's an area where there's a lot of potential, but also a lot of uh, controversy. And uh, there's this kind of skeptic versus believer dichotomy where uh, people will either just believe anything anyone says or they'll say, no, it's all contamination and nothing is true at all. And uh, uh, So those are the challenges, particularly if you're using PCR. So I, I uh, hooked up with this lady here, Helen Donoghue, who works at the University College London and had done some work on um, ancient DNA studies with TB and leprosy. And I'd, I said, well, why don't we try shotgun metagenomics or, as a approach in ancient DNA. And this will get around this problem of, of PCR amplification and the problem of carryover. Um, and we're not likely to see anything in the way of contamination of our metagenomes from the environment around us or in the lab from pathogen DNA or anything like that. And it also, it, seemed, it would be a lot easier if we're just coming into this. We don't have to go in there and, and start uh, designing capture probes, designing PCR primers and whatever. But we didn't know if it would work. As with, the, with the, the, the German E. coli outbreak, you know, you could sit in your armchair and think of plenty of reasons why it wouldn't work. One would be that there would be lots and lots of human DNA in there, uh, which would swamp any signal. And also, there might be lots of post-mortem contamination with other bacteria that might swamp any such signal. But we thought, well, you know, sequencing is sufficiently easy and straightforward now. Let's just have a go and see where we get. So just to contextualize this, um, Helen had access to some material from a town called Vats in Hungary. Um, this is in the middle of the country, in the northern part of the country. Um, and in a, a church there, the Dominican church there, in 1994, they discovered a crypt when they were doing some renovation work that had been sealed for the uh, best part of 100, over 100 years, 150 years, I think. Um, and they found within there 242 bodies. And for some reason, it's not entirely explained, Many of them were naturally mummified, which meant that there was soft tissue available as well as the skeletons of those individuals. And it was that soft tissue that Helen gave us access to. She gave us access to some uh, lung material. And we started off um, with some lung material from this individual, Terezia Hausman, uh, who was a young lady who died at the age of 28 on the 26th of December in 1797. And this is her, the mummified remains of Terezia Hausman here. And this is the uh, record, death record showing which day she died. So actually having material that was over 200 years old with a well-validated date actually was quite a find. Now, um, a guy called Mark Spiegelman, uh, who's a remarkable guy who's a surgeon and a kind of anthropologist, archaeologist, he had actually uh, retrieved material from uh, Terezia Hausman and many other of these bodies uh, under the best approach possible, using uh, fiber optic uh, endoscopes and so forth. And previous studies had suggested that there was a good preservation of TB DNA in the samples from this individual. So we thought this is a good place to start. And I'm cutting out some of the middle ground here because time is short. But to cut a long story short, we ended up getting eight uh, MTB genomes out of these samples, uh, and including with Terezia Hausman, absolutely astonishing coverage of over 300-fold coverage of one genome and 250-fold coverage of a second genome uh, found within, uh, within the metagenome that we retrieved from her. Um, you can see here that we had uh, similar success with other bodies as well in terms of the coverage although nowhere near as good. There was one, this unknown uh, body, body 92, that was a, a, a young male, uh, buried in 1787. We got 187-fold coverage of one of the genomes. But for the others, even with our best efforts, we were get, struggling to get more than one-fold coverage, and in some cases, we got a fractional-fold coverage. But nonetheless, this was a, you know, a considerable achievement in that we got eight genomes from 200 years ago, and nobody had ever achieved anything like that at that level before. When we analyzed these genomes, in fact, there were 14 genomes from the eight bodies that we analyzed here, and all of them had a particular deletion which put them into one particular lineage of TB, the so-called Euro-American lineage, or lineage 4. 
So that was our starting point. So we, we didn't see the Beijing lineage, which is, is very common now in populations around the world in that situation. What we found, though, was, as, as I hinted, that m mixed infections were common uh, during this, what must be peak prevalence of TB in Europe. So if you look at the, any graph in any textbook about the prevalence of TB, it's been going down since records began. And if you extrapolate back, then probably around this time was when it was at its peak, the earliest you know, stages of urbanization and, and early stages of industrialization. Um, now, I didn't believe this to start with. I, when I was first told, oh, we've got a mixture of two genomes in Tourette's Hausmann, I said, well, that doesn't make sense. How has that happened? But then we looked at the literature um, and, and realized it perhaps, and we looked at what we'd seen in several bodies, and we thought, well, maybe this does reflect a real difference between the epidemiology of TB in Europe today and what we would have seen at that historical setting. In this historical setting, where a large percentage of the population, and one of the things I forgot to say was around half of these bodies had evidence of tuberculosis. So if half the people have got TB in a population, the chances of you being coughed over by people carrying different strains or multiple strains is actually quite high. And this actually allows us to recontextualize mod modern microbiology because we went to look at the literature. And in fact, if you think about it, the way in which we do conventional microbiology is where you do single colony picks. If there were multiple strains in, a, in, a, in, a, in an in initial sample, you probably would purify out all that uh, mixture and just follow up one of them. Um, but nonetheless, even though that's what people do and don't go looking for mixed infections, there was one report from KwaZulu-Natal that suggested that 20% of patients in KwaZulu-Natal had uh, more than one um, strain present. And there was another paper which said, said that there were four distinct genotypes reported from a single patient. So I went from sort of thinking, well, this can't make sense, to thinking, well, actually, it probably does make sense, actually, uh, in this context. Now, what we did, because we couldn't um, draw conventional phylogenetic trees based on the genomes we had, because we had fairly low coverage, we used an approach called phylogenetic placement, where we drew up a huge, great uh, phylogeny, a 1,500 uh, uh, existing modern lineage for genome uh, 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 isolates, uh, uh, genomes, um, and then we were able to place uh, our genomes on that existing phylogeny, and that worked quite well. Um, and we could place 12 of the genotypes on that. And we found also that uh, in Terezia Hausman, she had two genotypes, and her mother had identical, or at least indistinguishable, pair of genotypes, suggesting that there was, this is the first time anyone's detected, an intimate family link between two historical cases of TB from, from that period, from over 200 years ago. Now, we tried to, to, to use uh, a program called BEAST. Uh, at least Mark Uckman and his uh, team who came in as collaborators on this tried to do this. This is one of those dark arts using BEAST, and um, it's, it, 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 it requires specialist skills, and I think one has to be a little bit careful interpreting the results. But what we found what we came to the conclusion was that having these two, uh, well, we actually end up with four genomes that are sufficient coverage that we knew were 200 years old. So we knew they would have, should have to have shorter branch lengths than the modern strains. When they were fed into beast, we ended up with a, the most recent common ancestor for this lineage four in the late Roman period. Now, uh, that's kind of interesting in its own right, but it also tied in with a paper that came out just before we published our paper, a few weeks, a few months before our paper came out, which suggested that the most recent common ancestor of all TB was around 6,000 years ago. Um, and that was quite a controversial finding because uh, there are people, um, including Mark Spiegelman and, and, and Helen Donoghue, who we work with, who say that they've actually got evidence of TB in Neolithic remains. Um, and how could you have a Neolithic TB if the most recent common ancestor of the TB complex is only 6,000 years ago. And this has raised the issue now that, ha okay, well, we better go back and look at some Neolithic material. And we're in the process of talking to people in Israel to get some material from a site called Atlet Yam in Israel um, and see if we can actually get, even if we got uh, not even whole genome level, but if we got a few hundred or a few thousand reads of TB from that material, that would be uh, revolu revolutionized our view of, of the age of TB. Anyway, this has been written up uh, fairly recently in Nature Communications. And just to show again that it's not the only thing that we can do with this kind of material, um, we 
have been analyzing material from a skeleton from a medieval village that was abandoned in 1426 from northern uh, Sardinia. Um, this is the skeleton here. And when the skeleton was exhumed, around the pelvis there were found multiple calcified nodules. Um, and we received some of these calcified nodules. Now, it wasn't clear what the tissue of origin was. Uh, I've spoken to some histopathologists, and they think that they're probably calcified abdominal lymph nodes. But we just analyzed them to see what we could find. And uh, I guess most people in the audience who've got any kind of clinical background will say, oh, calcified nodules are going to tell us about some more TB, aren't you? And that's what I thought we would find. But in fact, what we found when the metagenome was analyzed was that we found brucella sequences in there. So we started off with a 0.7-fold coverage, and then we went 10-fold deeper and ended up with a 7-fold coverage of a medieval brucella genome. And the brucella genome showed some of the signatures that we associate with, with aged or ancient DNA. Um, and using phylogenetic placement, we were able to show that this brucella genome not it was not just a brucella genome, but it actually belonged within the species Brucella melatensis, and it sat in a clade with other uh, recent Italian strains, um, suggesting that there's been continuity of that particular lineage in that particular part of the world um, for several uh, hundred years. In terms of context, there's a long history of brucellosis in Italy. Uh, people have used uh, skeletal remains um, in, in Herculaneum. In fact, the majority of the skeletons that are found on the beach there show signs of brucellosis. But only one other uh, ancient DNA study had been carried out, and that was using PCR. Um, and brucella melatensis is usually acquired from sheep or goats, so that goes with the long history of sheep and goat farming in Sardinia. Um, and, and there's this thing called the mouflon there, which is probably the ancestor, or uh, an early branch of, of the uh, sheep lineage. Um, we don't know whether this individual was a farmer, or whether he just as a, someone who ate dairy produce. Um, he had some changes in his skeleton that su suggested that he might have had a sedentary lifestyle, so maybe he was just a, a rich person who ate lots of dairy produce. Well, we're talking about... Um, Historical material, it's just worth pointing out we've also applied this to um, sediment, this sediment to sedimentary uh, deposits from um, near the Isle of Wight and actually uh, just had a science paper a few months ago uh, where we looked at wheat sequences, showed there were wheat sequences uh, 8,000 years ago in the British Isles. But anyway, most people here are not interested in history, they're interested in what can you do with this now. And so we kind of said, well, hang on, isn't it a bit odd that we've managed to get all these genomes out of 200-year-old material, but nobody's ever got genomes out of sputum directly through metagenomics. So, so we had a try with this. Um, Emma Doughty, shown here, is one of my PhD students. She's currently in the Gambia. She's been working in the Gambia on this problem, getting sputum samples, extracting DNA and sequencing it. And works. It doesn't work as well as you'd like, but it does actually work. We managed to get from all the samples that she analyzed using this particular approach, she used um, sequences that aligned to the um, M tuberculosis reference genome, um, and giving us uh, coverages that are fairly unimpressive, you might say. So the highest there is, point, is about 0.7-fold coverage others much lower. But when you think about the number of bases that you're actually getting, the pieces of information you're getting about phylogeny and, and, and about the identification of the organism, we are getting pretty, pretty reasonable numbers there, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Such that we could actually do phylogenetic placement here and we could take from all but one of the samples we analyzed, we could actually place them on a phylogeny of TB and say they belong to that particular branch of that particular lineage. Uh, and one in particular, uh, two in particular belong to a West African lineage, uh, sometimes called Mycobacterium africanum, that's, that's generally only seen in West Africa. Of course, we haven't been able to get to the level of calling out SNPs that might be associated with resistance. So there are some, clearly at the moment, there are some uh, limitations to this, but at least we've provided proof of principle. So where are we going in the future? Well, obviously, nanopore sequencing everyone's talking about, and this brings the promise of doing long read sequencing and also doing it in a very easy way that could be close to the clinic or close to the field. Um, and there are various tipping points that we can envisage. In fact, TB whole genome sequencing is, is now uh, routine in, the, in Public Health England. Uh, it's going to come in for other pathogens. 
better genomics has been used in a number of other settings, which I haven't had a chance to talk about, but, but for diagnostic emergencies, maybe it may be possible that we could do this for TB in the future, and we'll have to see where this goes. In fact, I see this as part of a, a, a broader view where we actually take any material from humans that's, that's been shed in urine or feces, and we can analyze all the macromolecules in it. And perhaps um, when, when nanopore sequencing can embrace RNA and proteins as easy as it takes DNA, we can just look at all these things and it all becomes part of an integrated program of diagnosis in the future. One last point I'd like to make, though, uh, is to kind of paraphrase, paraphrase a quote from Marx here, which is understanding what's in a population. I haven't spoken much about micrograms, concentrated on metagenomes, but there's some obviously a clear relationship between them. The promise really, it, it, the point we want to do is to actually change those microbiomes rather than just understand them. Um, and one area that I'm very excited about is the potential here for synthetic biology where we can go in there and actually create new organisms that will go in and kick out pathogens or re-engineer, re, uh, re-modulate that, that um, population in a way that's favorable to us. Um, one last point also is just to, to put a plug for the fact that if we're going to do these kind of analyses, and metagenomics in particular is quite processor intensive, memory intensive, we, we need uh, a better infrastructure, and we've been working on that to try and develop cloud computing, a cloud computing infrastructure uh, in this project we're calling Cl uh, CLIMB, for Cloud Infrastructure for Microbial Bioinformatics. Um, and uh, early next year, we'll be starting to uh, seek engagement with the wider community and get people into beta tests, uh, this kind of approach. So in, in conclusion, when I first gave this talk uh, in Berlin, it was close to where the Berlin Wall was, and I gave this quote from Lincoln Steffens, who was a, an American journalist who went to the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and he said, I've seen the future, and it works. Well, it kind of worked for a few more decades, but the Soviet Union didn't work in the end, so it's hard to make predictions. Uh, William Gibson said uh, that you know, the future's already here, um, and the fact that we can do these things in a university setting, in the ivory tower of a university, is one thing. Whether they can be rolled out uh, into other settings, into a clinical setting, is another interesting question. And obviously, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. But that's me finished now, and I'd just like to acknowledge all the people that have contributed to the work. Thank you. Thank you for trying to keep the time. Thank you very much, Mark.